Welcome to week number 13. Um, this week we cover chapter 14. And in this chapter, we're going to be looking at the functional groups of carboxylic acids, esters, amines, and amides. So without further ado, let's begin. And we begin with the functional group carboxylic acids. So recall, right, at this point, when we say the term carboxylic acid functional group, that should bring to mind a small collection of atoms that represent this functional group. Or the carboxylic acids, as you know, are organic compounds that contain the carbon, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen functional group, the COOH functional group, as we say. So let's show you the Lewis structure. Let's refresh your memory. How does this go together? Keeping in mind, right, that the carbon has four bonds to it, right? And each oxygen eight, the hydrogen one, um, or I'm sorry, eight electrons around that oxygen. Okay. So, um, so we're all going for an octet or the duet. Alrighty. So this would be the Lewis structure. Remember that the carboxylic acid is one of those functional groups that contains a carbonyl group right here, the carbonyl. Okay. And what is bonded to that? Well, an alkyl chain of some sort um, and a hydroxyl group. So just looking at it, um, we're able to tell some of the things that are going to uh, we're going to be talking about as we look at carboxylic acids. We have uh, a difference in polarity between the carbon and the oxygen. So we have a polar bond here. And our carbon is polarized positive, so it bears a slight, a partial positive charge. Um, we've seen this before, represented by the delta plus, right? And the oxygen, more electronegative, um, has that partial negative charge. So that bond there and the polarity of that bond is going to dictate a lot of the physical properties that we're going to see regarding carboxylic acids. All right, so the carboxylic acid, when it's abbreviated, okay, um, condensed down. So this would be the Lewis structure, of course. Um, there's a couple of ways that you're going to see it, so you have to be familiar with it. Um, condensed down, it's R-C-O-O-H, okay, in that order, in uh, from left to right, okay, or sometimes they combine those two oxygens, so it would be r CO2H. All right, so uh, keep that in mind as you're reading about carboxylic acid in the chapter. All right, so we begin with, as we have uh, with most of the functional groups, let's begin with the naming. How do we uh, name carboxylic acids? All right, so again, the primary method that we use is the IUPAC method. All right, so when you're naming a carboxylic acid using the IUPAC method, the parent, right, that three-part name that we have been using from day one, um, the parent is the longest continuous carbon chain. And here's the specifics underlined here. That includes the carboxyl group. That's what that COOH group is. It's a carboxyl group. So there we've got it. All right. Whenever you look at a carboxylic acid and you see this carboxyl group, the parent is going to include that carbon right here, okay, of the carboxyl group. All right. So now that we know, we're going to start there. All right. Let's uh, continue on. So you're going to number, 
right? Once you find that longest continuous carbon chain that includes the carboxyl group, the numbering is going to begin at the carbonyl carbon. That's what that's called right there, the carbonyl carbon. And you're going to count out from there, whatever direction, okay? Um, and number, all right? Any substituents, any alkyl groups that are off of the carbon chain are going to be identified by name, position, and number of appearances. So let's look at an example. All right, so here is a carboxylic acid. We see the carboxyl group, okay? And what are we going to do? We are going to begin our numbering right here, okay, at the carbonyl carbon. This is carbon number one. So this would be one, two, three, a three carbon um, carboxylic acid, all right? And so then what are we going to do? So we know the name for a three carbon alkane, right? It's propane. All right. How are we going to change that into a carboxylic acid? Well, the IUPAC names for carboxylic acid parent chains right, are formed by dropping the final E of the alkane name, right, the name of the corresponding hydrocarbon. And then you're going to add oic acid. Oic acid. Simple as that. So example all right we can come back up here first let's come back up here and let's name this one here so there's one two three that would be propane right propane and we're going to lop off that ending of propane right let's see if i can write this i should never do this right i complained about it the whole time we need a stylus propane so we're going to take off that e and we're going to put prop and o i c an acid okay and that's going to become one name okay um, so let's do it with this one here okay so we find uh, the carboxyl group. We're going to include the carboxyl group in, in our longest continuous carbon chain. So we have one, two, three. Oh, it is the same one. How silly, right? Okay. How absolutely silly. I didn't realize that. It's propanoic acid. Okay. There we have it. Let's do another one. All right. Okay, this one's a little bit more difficult. Again, we're going to find that carboxyl carbon the carbonyl carbon of the carboxyl group that's number one right two three this one is four wait one two three and the last one over here is four right sorry okay get rid of that guy so this one's three four and on three what do we have we have a methyl group okay so let's put it all together. The three methyl is going to come out front, three dash methyl, right? And it would be butane, but we're going to lop off that E and add oic acid. So three methyl but and oic acid. And remember, same thing that we did before, same convention, we run the methyl into the name, okay, into butanoic acid. Okay, very good. All right, you get to try this one. Okay, with very little guidance. All right. Okay, go to. All right. Find that carbonyl carbon of the carboxyl group. Okay, that is going to be your number one. Right. There it is. Okay. And find that longest continuous carbon chain. What is it? Well, the longest continuous carbon chain, we'll call it CCC, continuous carbon chain, six, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, very good. 
and it's an acid, right? A carboxylic acid, the functional group carboxylic acid. We always want to note that because that tells us the, um, the suffix. Substituents, we do have substituents. We've got two of them. Okay, so you've got to name them two carbon right here and one carbon substituent, ethyl and methyl groups. Note where they are in the chain. Okay, who comes first? Ethyl because we alphabetize. So 3 dash ethyl dash 4 methyl and run it right in hexanoic acid. Right? Remember the, uh, the hydrocarbon with six carbons is hexane. Right? Take the E off and there you have it. Okay. All right. Let's go the opposite way. All right, we spend a lot of time naming because um, that's a little bit more difficult. That's that's the bigger challenge. Um, you also have to be able to take the name and uh, draw the structure or assign the structure, right, from a bunch of choices that you're given. All righty, so draw the structures of these carboxylic acids, and there's two of them here. 2-methyl-pentanoic acid is, is your first one to try. And the second one is for ethyl hexanoic acid. Okay. So how do you take the name and translate it into a structure? Okay. Well, you're going to go to that parent first. Pent, right? Pent. That means five carbons. All right. Five carbons. And then you're going to look at the functional group. It's an acid, carboxylic acid. So five carbons and one of them, right, is your carbonyl carbon of your carboxyl group. And then the two methyl, right, tells you on the second carbon, I have a methyl group, right? And once you get that backbone, then all you have to do is to fill in every single one of the hydrogens to make sure all of your uh, carbons have four bonds to them, all your hydrogens have one bond, all right, and um, your oxygens all have eight electrons around them, okay? So here we go. So uh, this is the only one that I couldn't get with my program to come out, okay, is the carbon right there, okay? So there's our carbonyl carbon, one, two, three, four, five. Okay. Five carbons. Alrighty. On the second one, we have a methyl group. There it is, CH3. Now we go through and we fill in everything else. Make sure it has four bonds. Four bonds here. We put in a hydrogen. Here's a carbon. It's got two. We put in two hydrogens. Another carbon, two bonds, right? On either side, two more hydrogens. And then our CH3. Okay. All right. This one here, hex, hex is how many? Six. Okay, correct. And oic acid means you've got a carboxylic acid. So one of those six, right, the very first one of those six is going to be your, uh, your acid. And then on the fourth carbon, what do you have? You have an ethyl group. All right. So there you go. Let's end again. This is my program that I use to generate these with, okay? Um, it won't put a carbon there for some reason. All right, so there's our one, right? Two, three, four, and that's where our ethyl group is, five, six. So we have our six carbon chain. We put on number four, we put a two carbon chain. That's our ethyl, right? CH2, CH3. And then we come back and we make sure we have the appropriate number of hydrogens on each of the carbons. So two here, two here, one here, two, and three on the end. Okay. And that's how we do it. All righty. Make sure you practice. All right. Uh, more on naming carboxylic acids. It's like, but, 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 didn't we just do that? Yes, we did. We talked about IUPAC names. Uh, remember, you were introduced with a couple of these functional groups last week. Um, they have common names, right? Well, uh, some carboxylic acids also use common names, right? 
such as methanoic acid. Methanoic acid, just one carbon. That's it, right? Um, methanoic acid is also known as formic acid. Remember formaldehyde, right? So same sort of thing with that one carbon. Okay, so it's a one carbon uh, carboxylic acid. Alrighty, and another one is ethanoic acid. So that's our two carbon carboxylic acid. It is known as acetic acid. All right, and you might remember it from our chapter on acids and uh, bases. All right, uh, ethanoic acid is rarely called ethanoic acid. It's referred to as acetic acid. Um, vinegar is a solution of acetic acid. It's a 5% acetic acid solution. Okay, so uh, those are the two that you should be familiar with, with common names. All right, properties. Now, remember we said that the properties are going to come directly from that polar carbonyl bond. Carbon doubly bonded to oxygen bond. And because we have that polar bond, we find that compared to other organic compounds of similar molecular weight, Carboxylic acids have relatively high boiling points. And the reason for this is their ability to form hydrogen bonds with one another. So very similar to um, your, your alcohols, except for we have a little bit different scenario here. Okay, Check this out. Not just one hydrogen bond but two, right? For every two molecules, you have the possibility of two hydrogen bonds. So we see a hydrogen bond between the uh, OH, right? On the hydrogen of the OH on one and the carbonyl oxygen on the other, right? And the same thing, right? So they orient themselves so that you can get two hydrogen bonds for each two carboxylic acid units. Um, so again, think about why the boiling points would be so high. To boil, to go to the gaseous state where you have a lot of space between the molecules, right? We have to break two hydrogen bonds and that requires more energy. So the more energy you have to put in, the higher the boiling points. All right. Let's move on to our, our second physical property that we have looked at uh, through all of these functional groups, solubility. So the ability to form hydrogen bonds, in addition to the presence of that uh, polar carbonyl CO and OH bonds, it gives small carboxylic acids a significant water solubility. But as we have seen before with the alcohols, an increasing number of carbon atoms is going to lead to a reduction in water solubility. As the nonpolar part grows, it becomes less soluble. So let's look and see what we're talking about. How large do we have to get before um, the water solubility drops off? All right. So here's our methanoic acid, our formic acid. And it, it's primarily hydrogen bonding, right? Okay, with the water. So very large water solubility. Uh, we go to acetic acid, ethanoic acid, again, very large water solubility because our, our um, nonpolar part is so small. Here's two propanoic acid, it's still very soluble. And here is um, four butanoic acid, again, still very large um, water solubility. Pentanoic acid with five, right? grams per 100 milliliters, it drops off, okay? So one to four, five, uh, five, but greater than five, okay? So here's hexanoic acid and the water solubility um, decreases immensely, okay?
Again, we've seen this before. Uh, as the nonpolar part grows, right, the hydrocarbon part, um, the water solubility goes down because like dissolves like, right? Okay. So let's uh, let's take a little bit. I threw together some of the more common carboxylic acids. Um, and we start off with the smallest one. This is our formic acid. Okay. Um, it's a chemical that's present actually in the sting of ants. And that's what form comes from, that term formic acid. Um, and then we have our two carbon, which is acetic acid, right? Um, and this one you should be familiar with because this is vinegar, okay? Um, vinegar is a dilute 5% solution of acetic acid. Let's add on one, two, three, four. So this is four. This would be butanoic acid, right? It's a common name is butyric acid, all right? And it is, in fact, the, um, the chemical that is responsible for the smell of rancid butter. If you've ever uh, had your butter go bad and it smells rancid, all right, it's due to butyric or butanoic acid. All right, so how many do we have here? One, two, three, four, five, six. So this is hexanoic acid. All right, this is caproic acid. So this is a common name, okay? And it was uh, um, isolated from the skin of goats, and it has a distinct smell. If you've ever gone to a goat farm, that's what you're smelling. You're smelling caproic acid. Citric acid, okay? I don't have the structure here because it's larger, okay? Um, but it's present in uh, citrus fruits and it's also present in your blood. Okay. All right. Um, so let's now, this is going to be our link to our, our, one of our next topics. All right. Um, aspirin and other over the counter carboxylic acid derivatives. What? is a carboxylic acid derivative. Well, it's a compound that we make from a carboxylic acid, all right? Its precursor is a carboxylic acid. And um, so aspirin, this is the structure of aspirin. Aspirin is a member of a group of drugs that are known as salicylates or esters of salicylic acid and so there we see that i c acid right salicylic acid um so it is an ester of salicylic acid so we notice here all right some of the functional groups you should be able to pull out aspirin has a benzene ring right a benzene ring and it's an aromatic Additionally, aspirin has a carboxylic acid functional group right here, okay? And then here is the ester, all right? We see here's the R, here's the carbonyl, here's the O attached to a benzene ring in our group, okay? So aspirin is um, an ester of salicylic acid. In other words, uh, the starting material was a carboxylic acid. And what did we make? We made an ester, and we'll see that shortly. Acetaminophen, okay, familiar with acetaminophen. It is an amide, and it also contains a hydroxyl group. Acetaminophen is best known as Tylenol, of course. Um, it's an alternative to aspirin for pain relief. Uh, but unlike uh, aspirin, it is not an anti-inflammatory agent. So here is acetaminophen. Okay. Again, you should be able to look at the structure of this drug and uh, pick out the functional groups. Again, we see a what? A benzene ring. We see a hydroxyl group. Okay, and here is our amide functional group, the carbonyl bonded to a nitrogen. Okay, all righty. So again, why do we have it on here? It's a carboxylic acid derivative. In order to make acetaminophen, we start with a carboxylic acid, and then we convert it 
to an amide. Over here with aspirin, we start with a carboxylic acid. So there is a carboxylic acid group here, and we convert it to this ester. So that's what we call carboxylic acid derivatives. All right, which leads us right to our next topic, right? Reactions of carboxylic acids. We begin with the first reaction. First reaction is a really simple reaction. It's the reaction of carboxylic acids with water. Carboxylic acids, acids, right? Organic acids. Think back to chapter 10. They are not on your list of six strong acids that you learned in chapter 10. What does that mean? Well, it means if they're not on the list of six strong acids, carboxylic acids then are weak acids. And they're going to behave like the weak acids we talked about in chapter 10. So let's look, right? Let's take um, any carboxylic acid that you can imagine. It is going to ionize in water just as we talked about back in chapter 10. And what are we going to get when it ionizes in water? We're going to get the conjugate base and we're going to get hydronium ion. So let's use as our example, let's use acetic acid. Common name, right? It's IEPAC name would be ethanoic acid. Let's look at it and let's, um, let's, Put it in water all right and see what happens we have the acid and when we put an acid into water right what happens the water behaves as a base okay our acetic acid is going to give up its proton to the water and we use the double-headed arrows because it's a weak acid it only does this to a small extent right so when this gives up its proton right here is our conjugate base right the conjugate base we call it the acetate ion and we'll see how we do that uh, in a little bit okay and what else do we get so where did this hydrogen go it went here right to our base okay so we end up with hydronium ion h3o plus Again, the double-headed arrow, what does it mean? This is a, a, a weak electrolyte, right? We only get a few ions in water. Most of it remains in this form here, okay? All right, second uh, reaction, all right? Neutralization, all right? Just as we saw in chapter 10. Right, chapter 10, we saw that acids are neutralized by reaction with hydroxide ion base. Right, same thing is going to happen here. Carboxylic acids undergo neutralization reaction with bases. What did we get last time? Right, chapter 10, refresh your memory. Right, uh, we get water and a salt. Right. In this case, it's called a carboxylic acid salt. So let's let's use our acetic acid again. It's a good go to uh, carboxylic acid. All right. So acetic acid, weak acid. OK. There it is. All right. Remember, it's an acid. Right. So we're going to show that uh, acidic proton there. Right. It's in water. We're going to add base to it, sodium hydroxide, okay? And when an acid reacts with a base, we get a neutralization reaction, right? We're not going to have acid or base when all is said and done here. It's going to be neutralized. So we end up our hydrogen, right, is donated. It's accepted by the hydroxide. Okay. We end up with sodium acetate and water. 
So this is our salt, right? The salt. Remember what a salt is, right? Okay, it's an ionic compound and water. So same as we learned about before. Okay. These carboxylate ions, right, these salts of carboxylic acids, they end up being more soluble in water than the carboxylic acids themselves. And the reason for that is because you have full charges, okay? So these are um, soluble, they're ionic compounds, right? When you have the full charge, they are more water soluble. All right, so these carboxylate ions that are formed, let's uh, learn how we name them, okay? And again, we're going to use our acetic acid as an example. To name a carboxylate ion that we get um, when you take carboxylic acid and you put it in water or you react it with a base, right the ending on the name doesn't matter whether it's a UPAC or whether it's a common name all right of your carboxylic acid is changed we change it from IC acid to ATE okay ATE and again if you internalize an example you'll be able to apply it to any acid so our acetic acid, right? We put it into water, right? Acid, base, we get an acetate, right? We remove the IC acid. We add ATE and the word ion, okay? So acetic acid becomes, all right, we're going to drop the IC acid and we're going to add ATE right there, okay, and the word ion. All right. Okay, so we've seen two reactions so far, and they have to do with the acidic nature of the carboxylic acids. Let's look at a few other reactions of carboxylic acids. Our third reaction is esterification. In an esterification reaction, what we see is a carboxylic acid and an alcohol coming together in the presence of a strong acid catalyst. And when they come together, we form an ester. Right? So think about what an ester functional group looks like. Right? So here's what we're saying happens. We take a carboxylic acid, any carboxylic acid. So, this, so we're going to use that R, right? It can be any chain here, okay? And we're going to combine it with an alcohol, right? Any alcohol. But let's differentiate between the R group here and the R group, the carbon chain here, okay? Just so you could see what's happening, all right? And we said a strong acid catalyst, so... A lot of times you just see it as H plus catalyst, all right? And what happens? We're going to see that this hydroxyl group right here, okay, the red one, is going to re be replaced by the OR group in the alcohol, all right? So get ready for some magic, all right? You heat it, and lo and behold, there we have it, okay? So everything else on the carboxylic acid stays around the R, right, the alkyl chain, whatever it is, the carbonyl, still there, and the only thing we've done is we've taken that OR group from the alcohol, and we've put it onto the carbonyl, okay, so that's an ester, and this is an esterification, so remember back to our aspirin, right, we said it was an ester of salicylic acid, that's how we got that ester group on there, okay, it began as a carboxylic acid, and they reacted it with a, an alcohol, and they produced the aspirin, okay, and water as a side product.
okay, in case you're wondering what happens, all right, the OH and the H um, combine to give you water, okay, a sterification. All righty. Note on an esterification reaction, it's reversible, okay? The esterification reaction is reversible. When it is reversed, it's known as a hydrolysis. Esters undergo hydrolysis to give back the carboxylic acid, meaning we take the ester, we react it with water in the presence of an acid, and we're going to get our starting carboxylic acid. Ester hydrolysis reactions can be catalyzed by an acid or a base. So let's look at the net result of a hydrolysis. Again, it's just the reverse of the esterification. All right, so we start with our ester, okay? And we're going to either have an acid or a base, okay? And there's going to be water there, all right? So what happens? Well, the OR group, right, on our ester is going to be replaced by the OH group, okay? And so we end up with the carboxylic acid and alcohol. Right. It is the reverse of the esterification. All right. So this particular one here, we're showing it um, with uh, acid catalyst and heat. Okay. We also said the same thing can happen with base. So we would put sodium hydroxide in there. All right. And then it's called a base hydrolysis. When an ester undergoes hydrolysis with a strong base, such as either sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, the products that you get are slightly different. Okay, they're not a carboxylic acid, they're a carboxylate salt and the alcohol. And a base hydrolysis of an ester has, is called. Uh, a saponification so it has a particular name to it a specific name a saponification is a base hydrolysis of an ester what do we get a carboxylate salt and an alcohol okay so slightly different from the acid hydrolysis all right well as long as we're on esters let's name them okay so a reaction of a carboxylic acid gave us the ester. The esters are derivatives of carboxylic acid. How do we name them? Okay, let's refresh our memory. This is the structure, right? This is the Lewis structure, general Lewis structure for an ester. It is another carbonyl compound, right? It has a carbonyl compound uh, bonded to a carbon chain of some sort, and then an oxygen. And this oxygen is bonded to another carbon chain of some sort. All right. So how do we name them? When you name an ester, you place the name of the alkyl group, this guy here, the R prime Okay, the one attached to the oxygen. We place the name of that in front of the name for the rest of the molecule, which is the carboxylate part, the RCOO. -O, all right, that's the carboxylate part as follows. So this is how we do it. We're going to show all the pieces here. Okay, so let's take this particular ester. Okay, let's look at it really close. Let's confirm it is an ester. Carbonyl, right? Alkyl chain attached to that carbonyl carbon. And then on the other side, we have an oxygen, which is attached to some alkyl chain. Okay, so we have these two R groups, so to speak. Sometimes they're, they're identical. Here they're identical, each two carbons. Okay, but one belongs to... Um, the alkyl group right out front and one belongs to the carboxylate part okay so identify them identify the carboxylate part and identify the alkyl group okay and then what are we going to do we're going to put this name out front 
of that name. So we're going to switch them, right? We're going to take the name for this, put it out front. That's an ethyl group. Okay. And then one, two, three, that would be a propanoic acid, but it's a carboxylate. So it's propanoate. Okay. Um, we add that O in because it sounds better. All right. Propanoate. And there's our name. Okay. One in front of the other. All right. Now you get to try one. Okay. When um, you name an ester, just keep in mind. So I'm going to refresh your memory here. Okay. You're going to place the name of the alkyl group, right, in front of the name for the carboxylate part. Okay. So there you go. All right. Right here. So the name of this, okay, name of the R prime comes first. And then what comes next? The name of the carboxylate part. Right, this here is the carboxylate. This here, right, is that R prime. Okay. All right. So, with that in mind, let's name this ester. All right. Okay. Here's our R prime. What is it? That's right, it's a methyl group. Okay, very good. And how about our carboxylate part? Okay, our carboxylate part has two carbons in it. So, ethanoate, right? Methyl ethanoate. Very good. Okay. All right. We move on. We move on to a new functional group. Amines. Amines, remember, again, from all those functional groups you were given in Chapter 11, they're compounds that contain one or more organic groups that are bonded to nitrogen. Amines are relatives of ammonia. Amines are classified as being either primary, secondary, or tertiary. How are they classified? Well, according to how many organic groups are bonded to the nitrogen atom. So it sounds very similar to what we did with alcohols. So a primary amine. A primary amine has only one organic group. That means an R group, right? A carbon chain attached to the amine nitrogen atom. Example, a general example, right? So remember the relatives of ammonia. Ammonia is NH3, right? Okay, NH3. All right, so you're going to see with these amines that every single one of them has three bonds to that nitrogen and then that lone pair, just like ammonia had. All right, so primary, we have only one organic group bonded to the nitrogen. Okay, so how would you abbreviate it? RNH2 or condense it, RNH2. Secondary amines have two organic groups attached to the amine nitrogen okay they could be the same they could be different doesn't matter okay and how do we abbreviate it there we go r2 and h okay for this one all right and the tertiary as you might have guessed all right from our previous two examples uh, a tertiary amine is going to have three organic groups attached to that nitrogen atom Okay, so abbreviate R3 N. All right, you could see the similarity to our ammonia. Okay, ammonia has no carbons, right? Amines are organic, so they have the carbons in them. All right, where do we go from here? All right, um, don't forget, right, in a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine, the amine nitrogen has uh, of that lone pair of electrons unbonded 
right? And um, sometimes they're shown, sometimes they're not. You have to know that they are there. When a, a nitrogen has three bonds, there is a lone pair of electrons. Okay, so how do we name amines? To name a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine, again, using the IUPAC rules, the parent, right? The parent, the longest chain of carbon atoms attached to the amine nitrogen. It's numbered from the end that is nearer the point of attachment of the nitrogen. The parent chains of amines are named by dropping the E from the name of the corresponding hydrocarbon and simply adding in the word amine. You're going to write the carbon number of the point of attachment to the nitrogen in front of this parent name. So for example, we see it's an amine. Okay, so we kick into naming gear for an amine. Longest chain, right? Attached to that nitrogen, we see one, two, three. We begin numbering where? Closest to that nitrogen. So it's one, two, three. Okay. Write the number of the point of attachment. So it's one, okay? And what would a three carbon be? It would be propane, right? We're going to remove the E and we're going to add a mean. So one dash propan amine. Everything run together, right? We remove the E from propane, added A M. I and E. All right, let's do another one. Okay, so this is also three carbons. Okay, three carbons. But the point of attachment is different. So this is two propen amine. More on naming amines. All right, so both of those amines that we were looking at on the previous slide were primary amines. If a, an amine is secondary or tertiary, the carbon containing groups attached to the nitrogen atom are not part of the parent, that are not part of the parent chain, are considered to be substituents. And the way you're going to name them, we're going to use N. N is going to be used to indicate the fact that they are bonded to the nitrogen. So let's say you have a methyl group bonded to the nitrogen as well as the longest chain. We're going to call it N-methyl. If we have two ethyl groups, it's going to be N-N-diethyl, etc., etc. Example. Okay, so we look at it. You want to, uh, when you're naming a means, you want to put it into a category, primary, secondary, or tertiary first, because that's going to dictate how you name it. Okay, so here we see that we have, we expand this out, we have a secondary amine. Okay, and so we know we're going to use um, that naming system. We find the longest chain, which is one, two, and three, okay? And then we have this methyl group that's not part of the longest chain. So that's going to be um, an N-methyl group right out front. So N-methyl tells me attached to that amine that I have, right? I have a methyl group on the nitrogen and it's one propen amine. And let's do this one. This one's a tertiary, okay? So we see the long, if we're going to find the longest one, that's going to give us our, our parent name, right? Um, 
So there it is. And then we see some methyl groups attached to that nitrogen also. This is a tertiary amine. Again, that's telling you how it's going to be named. And this one is going to be N, comma, N, dimethyl. So you have two methyl groups, and they're both attached, right? Just like if we had two methyl groups on a number two carbon, it would be 2, 2, dimethyl. All right, same thing here, all right? Um, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, right? So that would be butanamine. And where's that nitrogen attached? It's attached to the 2. Okay, so um, putting it all together with the dashes, dash 2, dash butanamine. Okay? All righty. Well, uh, amines also are one of those functional groups where we do see common names. The very simple amines... All right, those with relatively few numbers of carbon atoms um, are often identified by common names simply by placing amine after the name of the alkyl group. Okay, for instance, all right, CH3 and H2. Okay, who do we have attached? It's a methyl group. So uh, a common name would be methyl amine. Okay. All right, let's try some naming, okay? You yourself, all right? You're going to match each IU pack uh, and common name to the correct structural formula, okay? So there are three of them. There's A, B, and C, okay? So three different structures and three different names. And you have to match them, okay? All right, so probably the best way to attack it is to look at the names and say, hmm, NN, that's implying what? That I have a tertiary amine, so I'm going to go hunting for the tertiary amine, right? And then I'm going to double check things. But here in B, right, I see a tertiary amine. Let's see, propanamine would mean there would be three. One, two, three. Yep, there we go. Okay, and it's attached on the one. All right, and then we have an ethyl and an ethyl. So, yeah, it looks like that's probably that one. So that looks like B. And N ethyl looks like probably a secondary. Okay. And so, yep, yeah, here we find a secondary. All right, and it's a three carbon that's the longest chain so the propanamine and then I have an N ethyl group so A would be that one and one butanamine by process of elimination but let's make sure one two three four and it is and all of them are IUPAC names none of them are common names alrighty very good again practice plenty of problems in the textbook all right. Uh, so before we um, we move uh, away, all right, to other things uh, involving amines, uh, remember back to when we were naming hydrocarbons, and we gave you some other groups, right? Group names, right? Halogens, right? Were some of them um, amines? Sometimes amines are named as substituents. Okay. Uh, when you see an NH2 group, right, attached to a molecule, right, it is known as an amino group. Okay, you might remember that. It's very specific, an NH2 group attached to something. It is called an amino group. Um, all of the proteins, so just a little bit of foreshadowing of things, right, um, all proteins are made up of amino acids, all right, what does that mean? It's a carboxylic acid with an amino group on it, okay? This is an amino acid, um, carboxylic acid, and an amino group attached somewhere on a chain, all right? So NH2 group is an amino group. All right, properties. Properties of amines. Well, remember we said that even if it's not shown, the nitrogen of amines 
has a lone pair on the nitrogen. The lone pairs on amines can hydrogen bond to water. So therefore, we find that amines are going to have better solubility than al better water solubility than the alkanes do because remember alkanes cannot hydrogen bond. Primary and secondary amines can also hydrogen bond to themselves and uh, each other. For example, okay, remember hydrogen bonds, a lot of times we've just seen them, the hydrogen attached to oxygens, but it, they also occur when uh, you have the hydrogen attached to nitrogens. So in a primary and a secondary, right, we do have hydrogens. So they can hydrogen bond with other amines. Okay, here we see a primary amine hydrogen bonding to another molecule, right? Uh, secondaries can do the same, right? Because they have that nitrogen hydrogen bond that's required to have a hydrogen bond form. Tertiary, they don't have any hydrogens, right? They have all alpha groups, right? So all organic groups, so they uh, are not capable of hydrogen bonding, okay? Um, so primary and secondary means because they can hydrogen bond, we find that they have higher boiling points than alkenes of similar uh, size. More on properties. It turns out that uh, amines, some of the smaller ones are volatile, all right, meaning that they escape to the gaseous state relatively quickly. And the volatile amines tend to have pretty strong odors. Means tend to smell like rotten fish. As a matter of fact, uh, that is what you smell, right, when fish rots, okay? They are, in fact, amines. Uh, many amines, it turns out, are physiologically active. Smaller amines are irritating to the skin, the eyes, the mucous membrane, and are even toxic uh, by ingestion. We want to look here at a particular type of, uh, of nitrogen compound known as heterocyclic nitrogen compounds. Um, this term heterocyclic is new. They, when you have rings, right, organic uh, compounds that have rings that contain atoms other than carbon, we call them heterocycles. If the atom that's in the, the ring, right, is a nitrogen, we call them heterocyclic nitrogen rings. It turns out that heterocyclic nitrogen rings are very common in natural compounds that are found in plants and animals. So here we see a huge compound and we see rings, right? Um, and these rings contain nitrogen atoms. So these are heterocyclic nitrogen rings. Um, and as a matter of fact, they um, make up DNA. Amines in plants. Alkaloids. Alkaloids. They're naturally occurring nitrogen compounds that are isolated from plants. Most alkaloids are bitter tasting. They're usually physiologically active and they're toxic in high doses. Some alkaloids you're very, very familiar with. They are in fact stimulants. Caffeine is an alkaloid as is nicotine. 
Other alkaloids are common painkillers, sleep inducers, um, and they're used for the creation of euphoria. So the three that I'm going to put up here um, are of the, the latter three. Okay, morphine, okay, heroin, and codeine. Okay, they are uh, alkaloids. They're naturally occurring nitrogen compounds isolated from plants. Here we see the nitrogen, the nitrogen, the nitrogen. And they all look pretty familiar, similar, don't they? They just have small little differences to them. Okay. See if you could pick out the differences in their structure. Okay, moving on. Reactions of amines. We're going to sort of cross over here. All right. We're going to tie in amines with carboxylic acids and then a new functional group, our last functional group of this chapter. All right. Where do we begin? Well, amines are bases. Exclamation mark. All right. Carboxylic acids are acids. Amines are bases. This basic property is due to that lone pair of electrons on the amine nitrogen. Okay, and it can be used to form a covalent bond with hydrogen ion, hydronium ion from water or from an acid. So the first reaction of amines is simply the reaction of amines with water. Amines are going to react with water. Amines are the base. Water is now going to behave as the acid. The product is what we call a quaternary ammonium ion and hydroxide. So let's take the simplest amine. Let's take methylamine. Okay. Methylamine, and it is a base, just like ammonia is. It's a weak base. And so in water, the fact that it's a weak base tells us what's going to happen. All right. It is going to accept a proton from the water. The water behaves as an acid. We're going to end up with the conjugate acid of methylamine. All right. It's going to accept a proton. Water donates the proton. When our methylamine accepts it, our nitrogen has four bonds to it. A nitrogen with four bonds, please note, picks up a positive charge. Okay, and that's known as the methyl ammonium ion, a quaternary ammonium ion. Quaternary because it now has four bonds to it. All right, and what else do we get? We get hydroxide. That's why it's basic, right? Concentration of hydroxide ion is higher than the concentration of H+. All right, so amines are bases, weak bases. Because they're weak bases, they not only react with water to give quaternary ammonium ions, but they're going to react with acids also. A strong acid is going to take and convert an amine into its conjugate acid. Let's look at ethylamine as our example. There's our ethylamine. It's a two-carbon amine. And let's take a strong acid, hydrochloric acid, right? It's on our list of six. Okay base, right? Proton acceptor, acid, proton donor. We're going to get a quaternary, right? Ammonium. This time it's a salt. Okay. We end up with a salt and we call this ethyl ammonium chloride. Both of these reactions, okay, both the reaction with water and with acids 
Uh, there are examples of neutralization reactions. Okay, neutralization of an amine. Okay, so this brings us to um, our last function group, the amides. Amides, recall, they contain an NH2 group, which is attached to a carbonyl with either none, one, or both of these hydrogens replaced with alkyl groups. This is what we mean. Okay, this would be an example of an amide. All right, so we see the carbonyl, okay, that has this NH2 group attached. So none, right, of the nitrogen hydrogens have been replaced. Okay. All right, here's another amide. In this particular one, right, one of our hydrogens of the NH2 has been replaced with an alkyl group. And what's the other option? We could have both of them. All right, so in this one, both of the hydrogens that we had in this particular amide have been replaced with alkyl groups. All of these, right, are examples of amides. Okay, the characteristic of an amide is this carbonyl, all right, and it's bonded to a nitrogen, right, that has either hydrogens, hydrogen and an alkyl group, or two alkyl groups. Okay. How do we name them? So nomenclature. Um, the name is based on the longest continuous carbon chain, triple C, right, that contains that carbonyl. Sound familiar? It should, right? Same way we name carboxylic acids. So just like we did with the carboxylic acids, we begin with that carbonyl carbon. What are we going to do? Because it's an amide, we're going to drop the E on that parent chain, right? It would be a hydrocarbon with an E at the end. We drop it and we add the word amide. Substituents, any substituents, you name them as usual, right? Uh, making again the carbonyl carbon is number one. So here we go, all right? So the parent chain, whatever it is, has to include that carbonyl carbon. Okay, all right. So this three carbons, one, two, three, this is propane, it would be, right? But it's an amide, so it's propanamide. Drop the E, add amide. You get to try one. I'm going to name the compound that's shown below. Okay. Find the carbonyl. That begins your uh, longest continuous carbon chain. One, right? Two, three, four, and five. If that were an alkane, it would be pentane. Correct. Remove the E, add the word amide because you have that amide functional group. Pent and amide. Okay. All right, so this is where we're going to bring in um, some of our functional groups that we already talked about, right? And we're actually going to make another reaction of a carboxylic acid here, formation of amides. How do we make them? All right, so this would be a fourth reaction of a carboxylic acid, right? Amides can be made from carboxylic acids and amines. We call it carboxylic acid. So here's its general structure. Okay. We take a carboxylic acid and we react it. Let's take 
ammonia. Okay, so it can be uh, ammonia or amines. If we start with ammonia, we're going to get our very simplest amide, the one where we have the nitrogen with two hydrogens on it. Okay, what else do we get out of here? We get water. Okay, so how does it form? Well, right there. Okay, there comes our water and then our nitrogen um, and our two hydrogens forms a bond, okay, to that carbonyl carbon. All right, this is known as an amidation. This is how we get an amide, okay, carboxylic acid and ammonia. Okay, let's try an actual example. Okay, see if you can come up with the product here. Okay, so there's our ammonia, right? One of those hydrogens is going to pair with this hydroxyl group, and the rest of that is going to attach here to the carbonyl to give us an amide. All right, here we go. There we have it. We keep the chain together. We attach an NH2 to our carbonyl, and then we show our water, which is also a product. All right. So if we use an amine, right? An amine, a primary amine or a secondary amine. Right? Same thing. All right, we're going to form water, so let's take this OH, let's take one of these hydrogens, and let's pull it aside and let's make water. Then take what's left, which is a nitrogen, a hydrogen, the methyl group, and attach it to that carbonyl, and that's our product. Okay, just like above, use the one, the general example above, to give you your product. Okay, another amidation. But notice this is that other type of amide we can have where we have replaced one of the hydrogens attached to the nitrogen. Okay, very good. Um, so note that these amidations are also reversible. Remember, esterifications were reversible. Amidations are also. The reverse of an amidation is known as an amide hydrolysis. We call it an ester hydrolysis, right? Okay. Amide hydrolysis, it is acid catalyzed. So let's, um, let's show it, right? Hydrolysis means it's with water too, right? So we take our amide, we add water, and heat it in the presence of an acid catalyst and we're going to go backwards okay what were our starting materials well they were carboxylic acid and in this case ammonia okay so that's what we form as our products let's take our amide product uh, from the other reaction okay and let's hydrolyze it okay and amide hydrolysis we add water we're going to have acid catalyst and we're going to go back to the amine that we started with okay and a carboxylic acid and that's it there we have it the end of chapter 14 um, stay tuned and our next chapter is carbohydrates, which in fact is chapter 13.